Good morning, Gen Lead. This is your host, Ashraya. And today, we're here to talk about cumulative leadership, especially as it is expressed through nonprofits. To that means, we have NSSA rep, Mr. Gerald Dennis here to speak with us, and we are so delighted to have him on the show. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about NSSA to uh, inform us about your role and your involvement with them? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, NSSA really is the second name we've had. We, our first name was Mount Vernon Technology and Science Youth Center for Advancement. And obviously by the length of that, that's where we got a new name. We were had the fortunate pleasure of consulting with IBM during the first end of our first year of organization existing. And that consultation included they're giving us direction and advice on a lot of different topics, including naming and branding. And one of the challenges we had is that we thought, they thought, and they we agreed that our previous name was too limited in terms of what it focused on or how it appeared to focus on. So we wanted to expand the focus and then be more inclusive of a larger population as well. Uh, and that speaks to why it is what it is though. And as I say, really is a response to the challenges of children, specifically the 9,000 kids attending public schools in Mount Vernon, New York. Mount Vernon is uh, one of the, it is the only major city in the state of New York where minorities are the majority. Well, people are like almost 70%. And that's happened over the last 20 years. I say it because 35, 40 years ago, my parents and the four of our siblings moved to Mount Vernon. And at that time, we were the first African-American family on our block. And uh, I was never in a class in school that had more than one or two other African-American kids in it. So it really was, that was the case. But now, though, obviously, the Vernon public school system is 97% of color, 80% black, the rest being minorities, uh, Asian, Hispanic, etc. And the real push for me was during a four, during a period four years ago, I lost my job. I was an executive with a software company. I lost my job. It gave me a lot of time to read and to uh, spend some time thinking about what I do next. And what I wanted to do next, though, was very different than what I had done for the last 25 years. So I recognized during my uh, fourth sabbatical that though I had done a number of things I was very pleased with, I had done nothing that left a mark in terms of the future, in terms of impacting lives that I don't know of, people that I don't necessarily know. So I really felt that I had the tools necessary to really make a difference in a way that could change lives going forward. When I read about how challenged the kids in Mount Vernon were, when I say challenge, though, it was very important to understand Mount Vernon is the third largest community in Westchester County. Westchester County is a very affluent county, it includes places like Scarsdale, includes places like uh, Bronxville, Cullum. And in those various places, the kids in those school districts graduate about 95 to 99% of the kids every year. Uh, whereas compared to Mount Vernon, 55% is the average population graduating rate. So obviously that huge disparity really distressed me in a very significant way. And I thought, despite the challenges, something could be done about that. And in my research, I identified that science centers when located in impoverished communities, oftentimes have a significant impact on the community directly, providing learning apparatus that is very different, and enhances the learning process by allowing kids access and exposure to the world of science. And given the opportunity going forward for jobs and opportunities and career-wise stimulated opportunities, it is critical that these kids get to that. As we all know, if you want to deny population success, the best way to do that, though, is to minimize or to limit their educational opportunities. And so to change that is just the opposite. Enrich education, and you'll see, I believe you'll see kids change significantly in terms of where we're going towards that kind of success. And over the last four years, we've seen that, though. What we do is we provide a catalog of different courses, after school classes, weekend classes, summer classes. This past year was our fourth summer camp. And we started four years ago, 2014. Uh, and we had 25 seventh graders in one class. We did science, we did math, we did experimental science, we did robotics, we did physics. And it was a great class, the kids loved it. And they uh, really, really left there with a different impression of what STEM was all about. That was four years ago. This past year, we did the same similar program. But this year, we had 100 kids in five different classes, from the third grade to the 10th and 11th grade. Every class had a science element, a math element, uh, 
robotic element and coding it. And seeing 100 kids over four years grow from 25 to 100 over, over the four year span, having five different grade levels really reinforced a number of things. Of course, significant portion of those, particularly the 11th graders, were all, most of them were in our seventh grade class four years ago. And they all have come back every year since. And they all have been able to record very, very favorably in a very positive way. I think that is best exhibited by a call I got a couple of weeks ago from one of the mothers, the young lady who was in our program. And she was almost in tears and telling me that, what well, she said, I wanted you to know when I called you first and tell you I'm going to get a full scholarship to University of Connecticut. And uh, the reason why she got that scholarship was because of you. And I, I, said, I, I laughed and I said, please. And she said, yes, because she wrote an essay about her experience with the STEM program that you've been providing over the last four years. And she told him how to change her life, how to change her view of herself and being a scientist. And they took her on and they gave her a full scholarship bill. So I think that's evidence that when you expose to provide access, no matter who the population is, if you do a good job in doing those exposure and access, you'll see a big difference. So, so we were very much rewarded by that. And that's only one of several success stories we've accumulated over the last four years, some kids really seeing, feeling, and touching science in a way they never did before. So we're very excited about that. So that's the story about Enza. Sorry to be so long, but that's the deal. <laughs> that is a very, very admirable cause. I'm very glad that uh, I can be part of such an entity as well. And uh, I definitely see that through my interactions so far, and I'm sure my future interactions with the Academy as well, that there is just so much potential, so much that's already being acted upon, so much potential for the future endeavors that the Academy will be in, in involving themselves with. And uh, to that point, um, what, what can uh, other individuals who are outside of the New York State or outside of um, even the country how, do to help um, NSSA and similar endeavors? That's a great question. It really is it's such an important question. I remember four years ago when I was contemplating doing this, uh, I really thought that even the narrative, the narrative being, we want to change the lives of impoverished children. What I should mention though, Mount Vernon, despite being less than 10% of the county population, it leads to county in murder rate, crime rate, in poverty rate, and in unemployment. And so that is a circumstance that I think is unacceptable. And so I thought that that type of narrative, bringing education, which is a key change ingredient, key change agent for anyone and everyone, I thought people would gravitate towards it very quickly. We get the money we need to build the center and to get it done in a very short period of time. That has not been the case at all. To my surprise and disappointment, though, oftentimes I've heard it repeatedly told to me that why don't you do it somewhere else? In another community in Westchester County. Uh, I, I kind of take it almost offensively because I go to Scarsdale, to Bronxville, they certainly receive it very welcomely, but they do not need it. They have, most kids in those school systems have a very supportive family structure and a very supportive family in general. The kids in Mount Vernon don't come from that place. They don't come from where the support is critical. Oftentimes in impoverished communities like Mount Vernon, parents often think, that their job ends with dropping their kids off to school. Then they get about the business of their jobs, working personally, oftentimes having two or three jobs and making ends meet. Whereas we know for sure that parent engagement is critical to success in every grade of education. And so that's the challenge, and that's why we structure ourselves the focus of this population. And we thought it would be successful in a very short period of time. But oftentimes I've found people kind of back away from it and don't give of their heart because they think it could be done in other areas, things like that. So what I need people to recognize though is if we do it here, it speaks of an example of what possibly can be done, what should be done in other places as well. If we wanna make a difference, they'll start where a difference will be seen very clearly. And so we need people to join us like you are in terms of communicating, in terms of engagement, in terms of helping us raise funds. Once we get the funds we need though, we'll have a building in place that will host classes during the day, after school every day, every summer, every weekend. And those classes will not only be for the kids in Mount Vernon though, but will also include kids outside of Mount Vernon as well. And so creating a science center in Mount Vernon, like the Queen Science Center, 
of the Liberty Arts Center. It has this rich environment of displays, exhibits that are all interactive in nature, you have a planetarium, have a theater, you have all those resources here, science laboratory, computer laboratory, all those different things so that kids can see this is a future for me. And that's why we need people to come on board in terms of resources, both educationally, teachers, etc. but also funding, though funding is critical to anything. Building a building or having a building. I was truly to expand, include every child of nine, every child of nine thousand kids in the system in our program in some form or fashion. So that's what we need. A leader is defined during a multitude of dimensions, and it's going to be our decision today to say what is it that particularly defines a leader. Is it the level of impact that they have upon a team? Is it their ability to coordinate with the team? As we all know through our experiences. Coordination is what makes a cumulative entity successful, but is that the singular definition that we can apply to a leader? Or is it their speed, their efficiency, or even is it their agility that makes them a successful leader? In your experience, which three characteristics most define leadership as an entity, as a role, and as a subject? As an entity, I think really is critical to have very clear and understand it and acceptable goals and targets in terms of where you want to go and the general approach to getting there is really a key I think to that. And that's been the approach that we've taken in terms of our efforts so far. Uh, individually I think the key there is really to have at least two or three tiers of how one do I get there one of the key elements I can measure my success towards getting there. And then what things can I do to recover from things that don't always go as well, or don't always go on track to where I want to get in terms of being there. Oftentimes I think we don't think through the plan B as well as we could or should. So I think having that in place is really critical to uh, overcoming challenges that will always, will always come about to getting there despite the challenges or overcoming them. Throughout our conversation, we've covered a plethora of forms of leadership, and today we're going to focus in specific upon four types of leadership. We're going to talk about these specific types of leadership in the context of how they impact the team, on how to implement them, and which ones we see prominently used today, why we see them being used today in such vigor, and what makes them the most impactful forms of leadership. Each style of leadership has its own particularities that makes it successful. Obviously, that's why it's in implementation today. But let's look at what makes each one unique and which ones you might be able to accord to your own set of purposes. Surely, we've all heard laissez-faire in the economic context. But let's look at leadership. Laissez-faire leadership is essentially one just like governmental processes that follow this method that is geared towards the people. It ensures that the power is in the hands of the team without particular implications or restrictions on this power. This can be tremendously beneficial towards a team morale, towards ensuring that a team is successful in its conductions because of the level of increased coordination between them. Autocratic leadership, on the other hand, is a far more assertive type of role, where individuals present themselves with the question of what type of team they want to be able to foster. Certain prospects, certain projects, especially those that are short on time in terms of allocation, necessitate this autocratic leadership, necessitate that assertive power, that assertive role that really defines what sort of mechanisms we can employ to ensure that all deadlines are being followed. Transformational leadership is an idealization that employs change through all of its conductions. The entirety of this leadership style is one that facilitates analysis of the team's conductions. It involves in the interactions that the team has amongst each other, the output that the team has, analyzing each of these factors to be able to come to a conclusive direction of what the team needs to change in order to be able to be even more successful in its conductions. Now, while we have all seen transformational leadership employed in part through projects, the question that really comes about where do we involve other types of leadership to be able to ensure that we have a fair and balanced way of implementation throughout our project? Lastly, we have transactional leadership, which is perhaps one of the most viewed ones in the present day in corporate environments. 
This type of leadership essentially facilitates rewards and punishment, just like we would see in any sort of corporate environment, where we have incentivization being of the essence, where we see certain projects necessitating some sort of team involvement that necessitates some sort of team review and therefore performance analysis. And each of these have certain according transactions that go along with them. And essentially, it facilitates a sort of team dynamic that ensures consistent agreement between the team entities. However, we do want to see how can we accord for part of each of these transactional, authoritative, tran uh, transformational, and laissez-faire. How can we accord for each of these types within a project to be able to come to a consensus with the rest of the team that facilitates the best possible Within your experiences with the Academy outside of this initiative and just general observances, what forms of leadership have you seen to be the most effective? Like transactional, transformational, laissez-faire, etc. Sure. I think, obviously, the goal is to get to laissez-faire. I, I thoroughly believe I work with uh, Xerox and IBM over the years, and I've had different managers, different managers' style. I think laissez-faire is really the most effective in terms of hiring the people who can do the job then allowing them the bandwidth to do the job, allowing them to be the master of their fate in terms of understanding what they got to get done, using their intellect to really master that process and move things forward, though. I think that really works well. I think most people who know that, though, also know that that's not easy to accomplish that. And that oftentimes, people may be challenged to understand or to comprehend or to apply, and so you need to really move up to that, though. So I think this story, transformational also work well and that can build you towards a laissez-faire environment where you have really professional, high quality, capable people in the right jobs. And they take on the task and then we can create a structure that allows us to have checkpoints, identify opportunities where we can take a look at what we're doing, are reaching our goal, reward, recognize and move forward. And that's, I think that's the ideal world. So using different formulas to get there though, at the end of the day though, having leaders in place to help the leader get it done is the ideal format. Who are your role models who have inspired you through the years and what qualities have they specifically exhibited that you want to emulate? Yeah, it's funny though. I have role models at different levels now. And one of my core cool role models is my mom and dad in terms of uh, people from the South, South Carolina. They moved up here like lots of minorities did back in the 50s and they uh, planted themselves here with the opportunity both of them coming from high school educations only, both of them coming from very limited backgrounds, both of them coming with big dreams. And they had a desire to do things, particularly for their family and their children, the four of us. <clears throat> they were so committed to that though, and that commitment really inspires me to a great deal. I remember my dad was a minister. He died about 20 years ago. He was a minister for 30 years of his life, and he really was committed to his ministry. But that commitment was reflected in every aspect of his life in terms of committed to people, committed to doing things, and he took great pleasure out of helping other people. And I think that led to my thinking about the center, in terms of creating a center of other people, though. When I was at my worst point, losing my job out of work for quite a bit of time, I thought of doing this, though, because I, I knew how, I remembered how well he felt and how he looked when he was helping people in a very positive way. So that kind of inspired me to do this, and I think that's where the origin of all comes from. My mom is the same way, very supportive, very committed, very, very much the person of, of support of other people do that. And then on the business level though, I remember there was, I worked for IBM and I, I got into a sales leadership role there. I had a manager who was just a fantastic guy. He made it very clear though that managers don't manage people, they manage processes and they lead people. And I think that is such an uh, inspiring view of how things get done and seeing him and it's a task, but lead the people. It's fundamental, though. And obviously, a lot of the people as well, though, I think of Martin Luther King, I think of Barack Obama in terms of what he did to overcome challenges. He was faced with so many different challenges as Martin Luther King. But at every opportunity, though, they found a way to work through it. Though. And that's what inspires me. Because during the course of this last four years, we've encountered a number of opportunities that have been the issues and challenges. But at no point in time have they been bigger than what we're trying to get done. So finding a way to work through with them has really been the way we've had it done so far. And that's the way we'll get it done going forward though. So people like that really do great things in terms of working through challenges. Though. It's very inspirational in a lot of different ways.
For certain, these are some of the most socially impactful individuals and uh, the narrative that you started with is is very moving as well with having that sort of background and I can definitely um, I can definitely relate to such experiences so that's very inspiring to hear. What are the most vital questions that a leader should ask both themselves and their team to ensure that there is consistent progress? I think there are two fundamental key questions though. One is where are we going to go? Where are we going? And two, the second is why are we doing this? And the why really allows you to address the many, many challenges that every opportunity will experience. When you say, here's where we're going, and here's the why. And then behind that, though, is how do we get this done? And the key to that, though, is building layers of how we get it done. The first path, path, path is critical. Having secondary, tertiary paths behind that, though, is really fundamental to moving it forward, though, because there's no way today, for all the many things going on, that you won't even challenge those issues. But overcoming them you know, can be best done when you have a plan that speaks to, well, A, driving to success, and then modifying where appropriate. Someone once said to me, though, uh, I was having some challenges of some sort. And they said, so what's your plan B? I said, well, my plan B really is to relook at plan A, identify the problem, and make plan A work. And that's plan B. And when I exhaust that, then I'll go to plan B. But I know oftentimes our plan A is oftentimes and well thought of, well planned, well executed, but sometimes you encounter challenges. But by no extent should that challenge subject you to abandoning plan A. What you should do is reevaluate plan A, make the decision made modifications to plan A, then continue with plan A. Then if you still continue to encounter challenges, then add elements to it though, including potentially going to a plan B when necessary. But that's the point. Yeah, that's very related to a workflow process that we might see in the corporate world today or yeah. other ones. So that's, that's uh, definitely a very relatable statement as well. In terms of then uh, that workflow process, having an idea that's being brought up in a team, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. Steve Kerr once noted that um, the quality times the acceptance of an idea gives you the effectiveness of the implementation of that idea. Do you think that this is a rather, although it is a generic sort of statement, have you seen it being employed within your own involvements? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think, I think the key that I, I, I think you're speaking to, and he's speaking to as well, is shared thought, shared ideas, and opportunity to really collectively move something forward. I think when you acknowledge that, when you embrace that, I think it adds a level, a level of energy to the process also to the people involved. People love to be engaged, but also love to recon be recognized for their engagement though, and encouraged for their engagement. I think those kind of things lend to that very successfully though. So I'm in full agreement with that. I think it does breed, does breathe air into the opportunity and air that really needs critical to survive. That's really very, very important. It also to energize people and get them behind it. And when you know you'll receive it in that manner, people will be encouraged to do more, to give more, to say more, to be granted committed to it as well. So I'm fully believe that there are. That's fantastic. So overall, overall, Mr. Dennis, what would you say that your formula of leadership is for the next generation? We've seen so many come up over the years. We've seen so many that have been played out in different situations and that have very different results. But for yourself, what have you seen to be qualities that you would want the future generation of leaders to exhibit. Yeah, I think there are some fundamentals there. I think you look at the transformation we'll talk about communication. I think that's essential in everything you do. You have to have a plan, but you'll be able to communicate that and engage others in communicating it as well. And that's really, 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 really cool. And then I think the key though is really speaking to people like their leaders. And driving them to think of themselves as leaders. And most importantly with that is holding themselves responsible for their leadership. If they can have told anyone anything, I think you really have to be responsible to your commitment and for your commitment and to what goes on in movement towards your commitment. And that is so important, the commitment and responsibility are the fundamentals of it though. And then the key I think is fundamental too as well, is really building upon how do we do this? And there's no better way to do that though than to engage others in terms of communication, in terms of understanding, or no one, in my opinion, works well on a silo. You want to have as many people in the, on the boat with you as possible so you can get there faster, get them more efficiently, get them more effectively. And so by engaging people in that manner though, 
they are rewarded both for being a part of it, but also rewarded for what they can bring to the table. And recognizing that can inspire, encourages, and supports people to get into where they need to go. And so I think those are kind of the things that I think are really so important. That, like I said before, the ultimate goal is always a fair environment where you can just have the right people in the right job, doing the right thing. They know how to do it though. Then you have your checkpoints where you can evaluate and determine what goes on from there.